We're speaking to Peter Atard Montalto. Uh, he's an emerging markets economist at Nomura International. And he joins us now on the line from London. Peter, thank you for, so much for making the time to join us. Just give us a sense from uh, the two options that seem to be on the, uh, on the table, whether shareholders are most likely to go for the full cash offer or they're most likely to go up uh, for the lockup option and what each of these means. Hi, good evening. Well, I think the difficulty really here is that there is still a discount in place for the partial share offer. So there's basically you get 5% less by going for the partial share offer. That is better than the initial offer, which came out a couple of months ago. That was more like an 11% discount. But it still seems to make sense um, for holders uh, in South Africa to go for the full cash offer. The one interesting one to watch will be PIC, though, which obviously have much broader set of interests around why they hold these sorts of stocks and um, for uh, given their mandate of you know, encouraging the local economy, etc., will probably want to uh, go for that partial share offer to hold some stake uh, in, the, in the company and won't mind about the five-year lockup that's going to be on uh, ABI shares listed in Johannesburg. Peter, it makes quite a difference as to what combination of payment is made as to the inflows into South Africa. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Exactly. Well, there's a big uh, issue for the Saab coming on the way out, how they deal with this under exchange controls, because whereas the amount of money that uh, is due, if you assume that everyone were to take the, uh, the full cash offer um, in, in terms of local resident investors in South Africa, uh, isn't that huge, really, at around $5 billion. Um, at around $5 billion. That jumps very quickly if you, if you include all the non-resident investors, um, the foreign investors that hold JSE, uh, SAB Miller stock that are on the South African share register as opposed to the share register uh, in London. That then jumps to about $18.7 billion uh, of inflows. So there's quite a difference here, and the SAR will be thinking about um, what uh, different uh, controls they can be putting in place to try and limit the impact on the currency. So certainly you're going to be looking out to hear how the Saab responds uh, to this particular offer. But Peter, are there any competition issues that we should be bracing ourselves for that could rear their head as uh, this transaction goes full steam ahead? Well, I think that's the most interesting part of it that wasn't really even considered when the offer uh, was initially made um, two months ago or so now. Um, and I think the, uh, the competition commission in South Africa is going to be um, one of the most widely watched parts of this deal globally because there you don't really have pure competition issues. There's not that much of an overlap um, between ABI and SAB Miller in terms of operations in South Africa. Um, but a case will be brought under the competition commission's public interest clause, which will allow them to basically look at issues around employment, um, around local content rules, uh, around investment programs um, that may be going on, maybe the need to uh, maintain uh, positive uh, local ownership in certain subsidiaries, uh, issues like BE in the Zanelle um, BE fund, um, which is going to be very closely watched uh, locally as well. All these factors are going to lead to probably quite a complex um, competition commission case for, uh, for South Africa and for Asia. To get through. Peter, they do seem to be anticipating the possible objections in some ways. The Miller Coors uh, in the US, because uh, there's uh, conflict there, they've said in advance they're going to sell that when they take over. SAB's holding in Miller Coors. And then the secondary listing in South Africa, that was going to be an issue. They've said in advance that they are going to seek a secondary listing. They seem to be clearing the way pretty smartly. To some degree, I think with the U.S. parts of the deal, there it's much more obvious where there are real competition issues, where you're gaining more than so much market share, um, that uh, ABI are able to take those sorts of decisions in advance. The problem with the public interest case in the Competition Commission is a lot more fuzzy. Uh, and we've discussed many times before around these FTI deals, the uh, developmental state conditionality um, that Minister Patel um, is so beloved of is this idea that ABI will have to give specific undertakings around jobs, uh, around investments in local content levels uh, in products uh, in order to get through. Now, I think ABI will have done their homework. They'll know what they need to do, but that's, not, that's the sort of thing you negotiate privately with government. It's not the sort of thing you put in a, a tender document, uh, an offer document like we saw come out today. So that process will, I think, come out in the open more when uh, the, the competition case actually starts. Mm. Peter, thank you so much uh, for making the time to join us. Peter Todd Montalto uh, joining us there on the line from London.